our God, the Almighty Creator of the heaven and earth, our Father, our everything, the source of our life. Today we are once again privileged as His people to come together and to enjoy fellowship with our God as well as with each other, wherever we are. We say thanks to His Holy Name for taking care of us all, for taking care of you, for caring for you, protecting you, providing for you in the many ways. And this day given to us, what else can we do than to enjoy such a time, fellowshipping, but also to express our appreciation and thanks to Him. So I want to thank God for your life. You are all welcome today to Kingdom Life Center Online Church, wherever you are. To God be the glory that you are here with us. Hallelujah. And that wherever we are here this very day, that your life will be impacted. Hallelujah. That you be strengthened, that you be encouraged, that you be motivated, you be inspired, that you be built up. We trust the Holy Spirit is here to lead us, to direct us, to guide us, even in Jesus Christ's name. Hallelujah. So you're welcome. God richly bless you. Hallelujah. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for another day given to us. This is another wonderful day you have created and have made possible for us that we can come and celebrate your such goodness as your people express our worship, express before you the appreciation of our hearts, that which you have done for us. As we come together this very day, we look up to you, even the Holy Spirit, that you will lead us, that you will direct us, that you will guide us. That you will cause us wherever we are, wherever we are, even as we are your children participating in such fellowship of the saints, we pray that God, your will will be done and you shall receive all the glory. We give you all the honor, all the praise, even in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And wherever you are, you want to really feel comfortable because in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. Hallelujah. God has blessed us this very day. And we have every reason to come before His presence. Hallelujah. Well, once again, I say thank God for your life and I welcome you. I hope you've had a wonderful week so far. Whatever you might have gone through, whatever had been your experience, your God has not changed. God is the same yesterday, He's the same today, and shall forever be as He is been. Hallelujah. And one of these days we are going to see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ come and take us all home to a better place, a better place. Hallelujah. I mean, however comfortable life may be for you here on this earth, this is not the best place for us to live. And not say that you want to die tomorrow, today, but we're talking about the fact that there is a better place. When that time comes, the Lord our God is coming to take us home. That is our hope. Hallelujah because of what he has done and his promises to that effect so rejoice and be glad no matter what you may be going through and know that god is the same and he holds on to his word hallelujah yes we thank god let us look at some scriptures this morning to begin with and um, to encourage ourselves before we get into that time of expression of worship i'm looking at two scriptures here to encourage us and the first one is about the songs of Korah of the which is stated in Psalm 48. Psalm 48, from verse 1. And it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. Verse 14 says, For this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death i mean the verse 14 is the emphasis i want us to look at this very morning as we encourage ourselves for this is god who is god we're talking about the capital g o d our god your god i believe that is whom uh you serve i mean you have placed your heart and commitment to for this is god in jesus christ for this is god our god forever and ever we will never turn to any other but except this, our God, the one that we do know created heaven and earth, the one that we do know when we had been found to suffer the consequence of sin, uh, he sent his son, himself in his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the, that debt, that penalty that we were supposed to face.
to save us, the one. You know, we're talking about this God. And this God, what does it say in the scripture? He will be our God forever and ever. Yes. We are not only just looking at God here or serving God here or little to God here. We're going to be with him forever and ever. As we even have that day, you know, standing before him. Hallelujah and glory. He will be our God forever and ever. And I hope this is, this is your conviction. This is your belief. This is what you have come to understand according to the teachings of the, the Holy Scriptures. You know, he says he will be our guide. You know, when you are to have a good guide in your life, it matters. You know, we don't know everything, no matter how much we think we know. There are some people who know so much certain things that they don't know certain simple, simple things, little things. Because that is not their area of familiarity or they have learned. They might know some serious stuff to do with science and whatnot. You know, but when you know, when you get to somebody who had the knowledge and the understanding is there, and the wisdom is there, everything is, you know, at, at abundance of such, that person is able to lead you, to direct you, to guide you. You know, no man on this earth knows so much than our God. And here we know God is the only one that can be our guide. He's the only one that can be our guide. David figured out when I said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's the only one we can look up to to guide us. In whatever situation of our lives, we need God to guide us. We need God to guide us. Today, we are what they refer to as what a satna. Even though it can do so much good for us, we know it is not accurate and cannot do so much for us. I mean, cannot give every direction and guide that we need. You know how sometimes people have ended up in certain places they didn't know to go because they could not figure out certain things right. But we're talking about the Almighty God. He knows all about your life. He knows all about my life, our lives as his people. He knows where we are, in fact, where we have come from. There are many things we don't know and can recollect of our past. But he knows all and is able to bring it to our current understanding. But more importantly, he knows where we are even getting to, where we're supposed to get to. And so he is the only one that can guide you, my dear brother, my dear sister. Whatever state of your life today, don't you lose sight of God because he can guide you out of that situation. I mean, it is not a matter of not being in a situation or being a certain, facing certain challenges of life. What matters is when he is there with you. Is the Lord your God with you? Do you see him as such? Is he your leader, your, in this case, your guide? And that you can trust him? And that you have that faith in him? You know, I believe that he's the one that you should place your faith and trust him so that he will guide you right. So wherever you are, as a student, as a mother, father, as a young youngster, whatever, whoever you are, in whatever business role you're playing, Whatever, I mean, many times we think it's only things that we refer to as spiritual things that we need God's guidance. No, God can guide us in everything. As much as everything is sourced from the spiritual. So this very day, I, I encourage you to look up to him as your guide. You know, look up to him to guide you. In the coming, this week has begun, we don't know what's going to be. But he can guide you right. That's why we should trust his word. When we look into the word of God, there is so much in there to guide our lives. And so whatever you may be facing, you know what? Sometimes it is a difficult of things, losing a dear one, and then we don't know what to do. Do you know what we should do? Look up to God to guide us through it, because we just don't know what to do tomorrow. We just don't know what to do next week. We just don't know what to do in the coming months and whatnot. There are so many things that bother us as human beings. So today I encourage you, I encourage you that just place your faith and your trust in God, because He will guide you right. Hallelujah. Isn't God such a faithful God? And as I read that scripture, I want us to also look at this scripture in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11. I mean, when we we'll look at the whole chapter that talks about the kind of God chosen fast, and then he begin to tell the people of God, you know, what he has called them to, and that if they were to do what is right, what was to become out of their lives. And so when you look at to this verse the level, it comes to say that the Lord will guide you continually. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Is this not the backbone you need to have as a child of God, any form of human being you are? Is it not the backbone, the person that you, I mean, the God you should trust? 
the Lord will guide you continually. When we have come to this very place and have this true relationship with Him, and that we're looking up to Him, He will be the one. He can guide us, and He will not just guide us today and leave us tomorrow. As long as we are there and looking up to Him, He will satisfy your soul in drought, in the time of drought. Look at how hard things are becoming as we speak. You know, difficult. I mean, the literal drought happening in the world, other parts of the world. Here, yeah, maybe UK, London, the only UK we may not experience such. But there's literally drought taking place. Some places they don't have water for months. You know, years, no water. You know, and you don't know what to. There's no kind of no life existing. But then again, in better for locally used, it can also mean the, the time of need, the time of when we don't know where some answers are going to come. You know, where some needs are going to be met. Where there are problems and everything that we look around us is difficulty. In the time of drought, He will satisfy your soul. And strengthen your bones. Bones. I mean, you know how sometimes it can be when we are not that strong and fit enough in our physical being. You know, we need that strengthening of our bones. That fitness, that good health. He will be able to do this. Not just in the idea of spiritual, but obviously He can do also in the physical. But here we're talking about he will make us strong, he make us faith, he'll strengthen our bones. You shall be like a watered garden. Can you see that watered garden? Looking fresh, productive, fruitful, looking with the glory all around. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Your water will not dry up, your waters will not fail. So I want to encourage you this very day with us to begin with. In our daytime with him. Our time together, this very moment of time. Be this man or woman who has faith and trust in God. Who is looking up to Him today and the rest of the day. You know, whatever you're going through, let Him be your guide. He will guide you continually. In Jesus Christ. Let us pray as we're, talking, we're looking into this subject. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you that today we are bringing ourselves of knowledge of the understanding, your truth. That you are the only one that can guide us. You are the only one that knows our past and knows where we are now. And you know where we're going to get to. So we thank you for the fact that we can look up to you and you will guide us continually. And whatever is ahead of us, we are grateful to you that you are this God. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Even in Jesus Christ, I pray for whoever might be going through any difficulty and challenge at this point of their time. It's like a drought of their lives. I pray God that you will minister to them and satisfy their soul, Lord. Strengthen their bones, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Let them be like a water garden. Father, in the name of Jesus, let them rise up from wherever they might find themselves. You know, whether sorrow, whether difficulty, pain, challenges, need, of whatever kind. Lord, be there for them this very day. Let them know that the God that they have placed their faith in, indeed has his ears open wide to their prayer. Even this moment of time. In Jesus Christ, and Lord, we want to thank you. And you then is able to say in agreement with us, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Good. So this is where we are. Isn't that awesome? That a day like this, we can look into the word of God and be strengthened and encouraged. But we also have the privilege word to exalt his name, to magnify him. You know, every Sunday keeps saying that when we have this privilege to come on a Sunday morning like this, you know, not only obviously on Sunday, but any other time like this, we'll be able to express our worship our praise i express our thanksgiving telling the lord how much we see him you know doing the things that he's doing in our lives and this morning we want to start with a song how great is our god we want to establish that part in our spirit of spirit sing it with confidence sing it with joy sing it with all the knowing that you know that god is great and this song describes who that god is he said the splendor of the king is clothed in majesty and say, let all the earth rejoice, including you, and all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. He is our great God. So let's be able to sing that if there's somebody beside you, even when they get to that point, uh, sing with me. Look at that person, sing with me. Hallelujah. So let us, at this moment of time, with the joy of the Lord in our hearts, you know, express this, our worship and declaration of who God is to us. See, hallelujah. Well, we thank God for another day God has blessed us with. Here we are, you know, once again to continue 
on the subject that we have been looking at for a while now. It's always important and good for the people of God to let the word of God, you know, take over their lives. Such reading, the Bible says, you know, let the word of God dwell in you richly. So we've been opening our hearts to get into some understanding of the church, the teaching of the church. In fact, next week we are looking at the actual, you know, the uh, uh, aspect of the church. We've been looking into the church, but for some time I'll be looking into the as they have to do with uh, salvation, salvation because the church is made up of saved people. The church is made up of saved people. So even to come to the point where we can look at to the church as the bride of Christ, you know, as the as, as, as the people of God, the family of God, the body of Christ, you know, it's important that we do understand that which cons it constitutes, and that is you and I. Those that have come to this very place of having accepted Christ, acknowledging who he is, believing what is being said regarding him as of him being their savior and becoming their Lord, and then surrendering all of their lives to him, you know, telling the Lord, I want to forget about that life of mine, and I want to commit my life to you in this new lesson of life. Yes, then we are counted as the church, counted among the people of God. And obviously, uh, getting to know that you are part of the body of Christ is a good place to be, a hopeful place to be. Because here on this earth, how many days are you going to live? And how many, what, what is it here for? But we, 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 are, we are looking forward to that day when he comes. Bible says he's coming for his bride. Our Lord and Jesus Christ is our our, the Lord Jesus Christ is our groom. I mean, it's our, it's the one that is coming for us, and we are looking forward to that. So I trust that as we engage in this scripture, you are understanding it and looking to the implications of it. That's why we've been looking into it. Some of us may be familiar with this subject to a certain extent, but if it is the case, I trust that you are letting this, you know, put in you a more desire, a diligence of spirit to commit and to reflect. All that God expect of his people the body of Christ the church the saved one in this very respect so that's what we've been covering for some time now and I trust that it is the case with you hallelujah today we'll be looking into some other aspect of it and then next week we'll come into it so let me just kind of quickly give a bit of recap as I always want to do you know for the sake of somebody who perhaps missed our last Sunday or some Sundays in the past you know, I'm not going to give a lot, but just to give us a kind of a sense of what we'll be looking at. So, as you have already heard me, we've been talking about the church. And under this heading, the church, we've been looking into the word, what? Salvation. Salvation. It's necessary we do understand that. And I'm sure for some time now, you have been very clear of that. Well, previously, looking into uh, salvation, we have looked into what the definition is. If there were two that we chose or we came with, you know, as of the scripture and interpretation will bring us to. So when we look at the definition of salvation, we said, and this is kind of reminding us here in this respect, we said salvation is, I mean, the, the two, the first one we said in, in, in basic terms, in whatever you may refer to in terms of, well, study of uh, or some form of theology, it is basically deliverance from the power and penalty of sin. Deliverance from the power and penalty of sin. It's important that we understand that. When we talk about we have been saved, it's basically saying that we have been saved from the power and penalty of sin. Obviously, we look at something to do with that last week, so I'm going to come to that. Then also we came to look at the other, which we say, uh, well, it is transformation of a person's individual nature and relationship with God as a result of repentance and faith in the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. I mean, there are several ways as the Bible would, you know, make us understand as to how we can become saved, you know, uh, and, 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 and the, the whole thing is encapsulated in this very statement that I've made here, the idea that you have been delivered from the power uh, of the penalty of sin, and uh, which we refer to many times redemption, you know, other words is redemption, you know. So when we look at this, yes, that, that kind of uh, something of a necessity to see us analyze well evaluate your life to see whether this is the case of you you know because like we said those things last other uh, the times of the past we realize that many people really as much as they go to church they're christian they actually have not come to understand these things as the scripture has to teach us and so we try to type this things i hope is bringing some clarity okay we also came to look at why salvation or what is the need for us to be saved certainly there's a word salvation redemption 
what do we what brought us to that place that we require to be saved why salvation why do we need to be saved and uh, we've been looking into the story i'm sure you remember very well we've looked into from genesis all that took place from day one with our ancestor adam and uh, the wife well uh, wife eve you know the, the the way the enemy came and deceived them you know as of thinking that uh, taking that with god had already for uh, Prohibited them not to touch, you know, the tree of the knowledge of uh, a, a, a good and evil. Uh, good and evil. He told them not to touch of this tree. The day that they would touch, they would what die. And that death we spoke of that very time uh, is referring to separation. That is the origination of every aspect of death you can talk about. Death in that sense, separation, which obviously brought in or gave the entrance to what we now are facing, which is a physical death. And then again. What could be the last uh, and more, 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 more serious one? I don't know what I should refer to it as such. Is eternal death. None of us should be facing that. None of us should be in this area. And though we were born in sin, found ourselves in that respect, we know God, out of His love, still made a, made provision because God has always wanted to be man. So when man was separated, you know, man by his own sin, disobedient to God's word. You know, you know, with all that release of the curses that today we are encountering or suffering from, you know, God still made a provision. Uh, in the early days, in the days of the Old Testament, they had to cleanse, uh, go before God by the high priest every year, who will offer sacrifice of animals uh, using their blood for an annual cleansing. So every year they had to go back for that kind of a cleansing. I and mean, it wasn't, it was a kind of like cover, you know, it wasn't uh, entire removal if you like you know which we at this moment of time by the grace of god the soft the, the, the sacrificial love, like we sang the song today through jesus christ we when we come before god and acknowledge him and receive the heart it's as if we have never sinned that is totally cleansing if you should use that word all right so yes we've touched on that but why do we need salvation and i hope you have all, uh, uh, gotten hold of that understanding but then again also look at to the link that it has to have with jesus jesus christ have you mentioned about the provision that God made? God made this provision right from day one. He made a provision of Jesus Christ who could, who was more or less himself. You know, Jesus Christ is God. He is God, the Son. You know, so God manifesting himself, bringing himself in incarnate of the Son of God here on this earth to go through that which mankind, you know, uh, was facing and to suffer and to be killed or to like crucify, that actual word, crucify and resurrected you know, bringing man to a place of reconciliation with God. So, again, when we mention these things, we kind of mention the emphasis of the fact that it cannot be any other by Jesus Christ. Nobody on this earth, nobody, nobody calls themselves Guru, Master, Savior, Messiah. There's nothing like that. There's no other, you know, on this earth. No book has any records stating about what Jesus Christ had to go through and what even before he came, look at before he came, the prophecy that was to do with his life mentioned long before he was born as a human being here on this earth. You know, everything was known about what, what sort of uh, a person was going to become on this earth, you know, how he was going to grow, how he was going to face, you know, even life on earth with 100% human, yet God, you know, and yet to go through suffering, die in the cross of Calvary, but also to resurrect. And now knowing very well that he is on the right hand side of the Father making intercession for us. He's made us a promise. He said he needed to go. After his erection, he said I have to go. And go and get a, a place prepared for his people. And that's what we're talking about. Like his people referring to you. I believe you continue to live in this relationship with God. Don't let anything for whatsoever make you give up on God. You keep. I mean, when I hear people say they don't, there's no God, I just I just feel for them. And all I can do is to pray for them. Because scientifically, even there's every evidence that this earth or this world is not as it by its own. Somebody had created it. But having to say this is to make you to understand that there is an existence of God, the Almighty God. And in Him we have Jesus Christ offered to us, our Savior. He loves you, He loves me. No matter where you are in this point of your life, remember that He loves you. He came not for the righteous. He came for us. So, yes. So, we look at that as to why Jesus is the link. If you like, Jesus is the only He is the way, the truth, and life. No one gets to the Father except by If we're going to be reconciled to God, 
come brought back to God once again, it couldn't be any other than Jesus. No other. There are things people are doing on this earth, trying to do on this earth, thinking that as they do it to please this God. They know there's some God there. And so they are working hard physically, you know, doing all that they believe they should do in order to get back to God. It's as if there's a still sense of people knowing that they have to relate to some God. But what they don't realize and haven't understood is they cannot get to God with their arms given. Yes, good as you should give to support the needy and to do all that is expected. You cannot reach God. You cannot be in that place of pleasing God and to fit into that which he has stated as how to make you receive salvation. Except Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is no name given unto us here, you know, under heaven, on earth here, that we can be saved except the name Jesus. The Son of the living God, he's the only one. So we learn a lot of scriptures that kind of put us into that place, understand that it's a sin. I, I kind of, you know, stressing this a bit because it's necessary. You know, it's necessary. And I want to believe that you as a person that is part of the church and go to church and believe in this, uh, the Holy Scriptures, you would really see that this foundation in you is firmly established. That there is none other. Not nothing. Let not, let not the problems you are facing, let not the experience of negativity, let not the excuse which is not even there to put you off, you know, of God. Remember all the time that the love of God is everlasting. Hallelujah. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I encourage you about that aspect, and I hope you have been following to this aspect. So this is what we've been looking at, you know, looking into the idea, understanding of what the Holy Scripture teaches about him right isn't that good so when we mention those things it tells us about the sort of people we were and the sort of people we are and the sort of people we become or we have become when we have received jesus christ i mean we have already established a certain point that you you, you don't you don't become a christian or become saved by doing certain things you know this by now so i hope i don't have to spend too much time on that Going to church is not going to make you a Christian. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. More the right way I will use it is to be saved. Because everybody claims to be a Christian because they are somehow following Christ. You know, so you may think you're going to church. You may think you're a Christian. But that does not make you accept you're going by that stated word, that truth of God, which God has made us understand. You know, and we have kind of uh, established this and I hope you are remembering this. There are several ways as it has been put in the word of God. For instance, the Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. You see it very clearly then John 3 verse 16. Then you go on and it talks about in Romans chapter 10, that when we have come to hear the word of God, you know, and then we had believed what has been said with God regarding Jesus Christ as to what he had to go through, as for our life of salvation, when we believe and accept this by faith, and for that matter, we turn away from our evil ways, you know, which is the word repentance, and surrender our life to Him, receiving Him, confessing that He is our Savior, and also becoming our Lord, the Bible tells us that that commitment, not just declaration, but that which has taken place, that conviction, that affects our mindset, if like our paradigm, our world, doing things, you know, then the Bible brings us to a place that we are what? We are saved. It's a kind of, I keep saying that salvation is the, the greatest blessing and also the greatest miracle any human being would experience, you know, and uh, also establish the fact that it's not what we do, so you know that. So you you cannot, I think the, the, the weeks past we talked about, you cannot end your salvation. You cannot. So remember that, you know, you cannot end. If you know people who think they can end, also bring the word of God to make them understand we are not in the position in a, in a, to end. How can we end salvation? All right, but we receive salvation as a gift. It's God's gift freely given to us. So when we come to that place and then we receive that gift, hallelujah, then we identify in this very new status of life. And today I want to see if I can touch a bit on the status that we gain uh, when we become Christians. Having done all that is required of our lives. Uh, I hope now to this point you know what we mean by you know having a true relationship with God, receiving this Christ into your heart, becoming born again, you know, all that we have been establishing, the idea that we are saved. But what does that mean when a person says, I am saved? What does that mean? And I want to touch on a few today, 
you know, as time would allow us. What would that mean if a person is in Christ or he is saved? You know, and I think there are about, we can look at some four aspects of it, you know, or maybe let's say a minimum of three. You know, one is that we receive a new life. We receive a new life. And let's, it reminds me of this story that I came across not too long. There is this uh, slave that was, I'm sure you might have heard, come across or heard about this story before. Uh, a, a slave that was kind of put into a place of being sold, I mean, for sale. You know, and there was this wealthy farmer who happened to be at that very place. And uh, the slave, obviously, if the slave, what do you do? A slave always would always, always, you know, serve his master by offering work, doing all that uh, terrible job. You, you have no choice. A slave has no choice. You just told to do what is expected of you. And sometimes on a very, very uh, difficult conditions because you have, you have, you are a slave. You know, so this... Uh, a wealthy farmer happened to be in that place when this person, uh, slave as he ate, was being sold, and he opted to buy this very sale, uh, slave man, if you like. No, do you know what? When this wealthy man bought this slave, you know, the first thing, actually, on your way home, and uh, discussing about all that this wealthy man was having planned for this very um, slave, the slave person keep on saying that I'm not gonna work for you I'm not gonna work for you. I don't want to work for you I'm not gonna work for you all he kept saying was I don't want you I don't want to work for you because all it's like all that he has known is about being a slave is just working 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 for his master so he presumed at that very time it's gonna be the same and then the, they got to wherever the wealthy farmer lives you know had already prepared this wonderful room I mean wonderful I mean everything set in place and they told him, give him this new clothes to put on and uh, prepare meal and whatever was necessary, I mean, for any, any normal person. So it was offered to him. And this, this slave still kept on saying, I don't want to save you. No matter what you do, I don't want to save you. You know, in short, short of the story is that, you know, the man, the wealthy man came and told this slave, these are all yours. These are all yours. I bought you not to work for me. I bought you, as a matter of fact, to save you. To save you. Hallelujah. So can you, can you, can you, oh well, it's a story for, but for some form of illustration, more or less talking about, I mean, obviously we can't refer the wealthy farmers to Jesus, but giving us a sense of the fact that Jesus Christ, when he came here, basically he bought us from slavery. He paid the price that we were facing, ending up in hell, you know, facing the consequence. I mean, today as we are on this earth here, which obviously what is going to happen on this earth here, we are suffering the consequence or the curse of the law, you know. But Jesus Christ has come to set us free. Hallelujah. And these are some of the things we're looking at this very day. That when I say I'm saved, what does it mean? In this very slave's kind of situation, what he didn't realize is a new life. He had received a new life. He was no more the slave man or slave person. He has a different status. He was, if you can, if you can, he says a free, a free man. Hallelujah. He's a free man. He's been set free. He's redeemed. Hallelujah. From all his suffering, all his struggles, all his pain. Now he was meant to be living comfortably with what? With his wealthy, you know, farmer uh, owner. You know, he wasn't buying for that. You know, so that, that this aspect that we don't understand. And I'm reading this because of how sometimes, even where we are as believers of Christ, we don't seem to realize what Christ has done for us. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say to surprise you, but you hear sometimes where Christians are saying certain things that actually they have been delivered from. They have been set free from. They're still thinking of the old nature, old experience. They're still thinking, though they say they have received Christ, they still don't have knowledge about where they have been brought to. So today, let's look at a few. There's so many you can come across in the Word of God. But let's look at a few here and see what we can handle. I wish we can, we can look at a lot, a lot of them. But, brethren, you know, let us see what we can do. So first and foremost, we're going to look into an aspect of what a new life that has been given to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are saved, you must understand that you have been offered a new life. And actually, I've started by the first one. What did I say? I said in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, believes in him. I mean, talking about believing in God is not knowing about him. You know, it's an understanding that brings you a place of faith in God. You know, to trust and kind of uh, empty yourself 
in him and looking up to him. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So the life that we have as the saved people of God is not the same that we were already getting, I mean, we we're, we're, we're condemned to. You know, before we knew Christ, uh, I'm sure when we learn about that, before we all uh, came to the Lord, we were all sinners. We were all sinners as a result of our, our ancestor Adam. And we learned that, you know, the other day in Romans, you know, that out of, because of the sin of a man, of an individual, you know, sin came to humanity, the whole people, you know, of creation. But because of one man, obedience, you know, we all today receive righteousness. So you can tell that it is as a result of our Lord Jesus Christ today, we are in this very new place. So when we believe in him, we have eternal life. Believe this. I mean, it's a very familiar scripture. We look at it and use it many times, sometimes quote it without even realizing the power there. You know, because to, to know that you have eternal life is a new place. It's a new place of status. You know, you are not the same slave. You know, as we keep saying, Christ is coming. Coming back to take his people. When he comes, he's coming to those that he had gotten them to himself. Those that have acknowledged and what is the word? I believe who he is for them and for humanity. And for that matter, have surrendered their life to. You know, so it's a wonderful place to be. Now, there are implications. So when you talk about all these things, it, there are certain things we should be considering. If this is the case, how I'm supposed to be my life, how I'm supposed to, you know, develop and grow and keep in this very walk with God, you know, well, I mean, we would have, would, would have liked to dwell on some of these things, the fact that we are saved and by being saved. But this is one scripture you want to hold on to, okay? Another thing you want to look at in this aspect of uh, the fact that when we say we are saved, what has taken place in our life? Let's look at this from... Um, I look at Romans chapter 5 verse, verse 5 that now hope does not disappoint because the, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, here to the Romans, you know, being made to understand what has actually taken place in their lives here. You know, and here in this very case, hope does not disappoint. But it says what? The love of God has been poured. To be called a person that you refer to of yourself as if it is of the fact that God has poured his love into your heart by the Holy Spirit. I mean, we are where we are, knowing what we know, you know, we can celebrate what we have to celebrate because we know the love of God has been poured into what into our hearts. So take note of that fact, the fact that God has poured his love into our heart. I mean, there's several scriptures, like I said, that is a kind of it's not it's stated in certain different ways, but have this kind of need for understanding. Let's look at another one in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. That the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit is the bear witness of our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, I'm reading verse 16, I think I just read that. Let me rather go back to verse 15. Verse 15, all right. For you did not receive the Spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So even this verse 15, when you look at that, it tells you that, obviously being spoken to the people of faith, people of God, people that have experienced and looking forward to Christ as their Lord and Savior, and making them understand, for making them understand the sort of what spirit they have received. That spirit of God that we have received, you know, in us has not to put us in the place of fear, you know, but to res that spirit of what adoption by whom we cry, Abba Father. We have now a relationship with who? With God. But the sisters of the Spirit Himself bears witness. Hallelujah. We have this testimony of the Spirit that we are what? We are His children. This bear witness with our Spirit that we are children of God. And I'm sure you know that without a doubt. I mean, I, mean, I don't know, but for any true believer of Christ, you know without a doubt. You know, at that very point of receiving Christ, you know it doubt. There are certain times we have found ourselves, you know, uh, in, in a certain failure of keeping up with what God has built up us and make us feel like it's not the case. But no, you know, you all, all you do when you have found your life not in the way God expects you to uh, walk in, in it is to just turn away from it. Confess, repent, and turn away from it. Hallelujah. <clears throat> okay, so looking at these things, the Bible continues to tell us a certain thing that's taking place. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Now let's look at that, talking about what we have become in this new life in this new life we are now what we are the temple of the holy spirit first corinthians 
chapter 6. Chapter 6. Now, we pointed to some of these things because it's necessary. When you know who you are now as a saved person, you, it helps you to conduct your life accordingly. Okay? It's not saying that, oh, you're saved, so automatically this is happening. In fact, when we say we are saved, it's because we are looking to scriptures to know how God expected us to live the way we're supposed to live, adhering or obeying, so that we fit into what is required of our life. And this very case in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, what did I say? Verse 20, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, and you are not your own? I'm not speaking within the context of which you're speaking, but it is just a, it's a statement that is uh, as true in, in, the, in the point we are kind of coming to now. Because when looking to this aspect, here was talking about obviously how we have to uh, take care of our, our bodies, not giving to all these that is taking place, uh, sexual sin or whatnot. But then again, he pointed the father. Don't you know that now that you are a saved person, you are, you are the body, you are a habitation for the Holy Spirit? Can you think about it? The father, oh wow, I'm saved. And to know that I, my body, you know, is the what? The temple of what? We have become, we have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you become the temple of the Holy Spirit, it means you have to take good care of that body. You have to be concerned of how you con. You know, manage that body. What I mean, manage is how you take care of that body. Obviously, it's not by your own ability or by your own whatever strength. It is the way that you want to make sure if everything is done in a way that the Holy Ghost can live. You know, Holy Ghost does not come to live in the in the in the what a tainted place of sin. You know, so you cannot call yourself a Christian, a saved person, and so your life is dominated by sin day in and day out. And expect that the Holy Ghost will be there. You know, it does not. It won't, it's not applicable because the Holy Ghost wants to come into your heart and for Him to function, take over, lead, direct, and guide you, you know, in this new life. And if the conditions are appropriate, then that's where He wants to lead. So know that your body, your, you are the temple, it's not your body, your, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as said in this very scripture. So I, we, I hope we are looking at a number of things pointing out to. Uh, what has become of our this new life in Christ Jesus? Hallelujah. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Verse 12, 27 says this. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. I'm only just speaking on those very verses. You can look at it in the context to give you a better understanding of that which it stands in. But here again, in this new life, we are being referred to being part of the body of Christ. If you are saved, as we'll be looking into the teaching of the church, which is the body of Christ, we are part of the body of Christ. You are part of the body of Christ. That's what it says in this very scripture that we just read here. You know, what a confidence, what a good way of knowing who you are in this very respect. You know, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Hallelujah. So I hope, I hope when we say we are Christians, it's not the idea that we are going to church by the fact that we belong to the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And certainly if you belong to the body of Christ, you know the requirement, what God, you know, will expect of you being part of his body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let's look at another scripture here. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. This is an area. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, when you when you're reading these things, again, you know that it's kind of has some application to our lives we here can identify with the church in galatia you know those who existed at that that place of uh, faith you know christ has done something he has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us well the question you should be asking yourself has christ become this did christ was i mean really really you know a, a show of demonstrated set of his life you know to this extent you know Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. When Christ was crucified, that's what he came to do. That's what he came to do. He came to deliver us. He came to what? I said here, yeah, he came to redeem us from the curse of the law. So you, if you understand what the curse of the law is, you can stand in faith, you know, and this authority, this reference, and accept yourself the freedom that Christ has come to offer you as a redemptive person. Hallelujah. Christ has come to redeem us. You are a redeemed person. I mean, the Bible says, let the redeemer of the Lord's word say so. You should be able to get up in the morning and no matter what you're facing, say, hey, 
I am the redeemer of the Lord. Many times the enemy does not want God's people, you know, uh, to be able to declare those things, to have that faith, to have that understanding as such people. The first Peter chapter 1, verse 23. What has taken place? What are what's this new life that we are now, you know, uh, benefiting from because of Christ's work? First Peter 1 23. First Peter 1 23. And it says this here. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God for what he has done for us and brought us to. Hallelujah. Verse 23, I read from verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Verse 23 says, having been born again, take note of it, having been born again, not of corruptible seed but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Hallelujah. You know, so we, we, we in this very place, we are being told, we have been born again of the word of God. Having been born again, I'm born again, as we know from John chapter 3, Nicodemus experience, we're being told to be born again. We have been born again, you know, yeah, people can say they have received Jesus Christ into their life, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to say I've been born again. How did we get born again? We got born again because of the word of God. So again, if we are in this new place that we were, we, we, we cannot compare us of the past. Born not of the, not, I said, not born not of this, but for the incorruptible. Verse 23, I read it again. Having been born again, not of corruptible. You know, something that can easily, you know, it's corrupt if you like, break, I mean, you know, can stay forever. But the seed, but incorruptible through the word. There's nobody calling yourself a Christian who says he has been born again. Uh, without the word of God, in the relation to the word of God. Because in the relation of the word of God, that is where you come to know it's Jesus Christ that can make you safe. It's Jesus Christ who has died for you. Hallelujah. So I hope all this is helping us to see how the new place that we have been. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, let's look at the scripture in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 9. It reads, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from sin. Can you see that? And it goes on to say that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you can tell from this very scripture the power of Christ giving us the forgiveness. Forgiveness and wash clean. By his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, not talking about even the point of coming to salvation, but as we live as Christians, whenever we are to find ourselves not walking in the ways of the law, I mean, to put it this way, to, if we, we, are, we, are, we are no more sinners, though we may sin. I mean, that's the difference in there. As believers, we want and we're sinners, but as, as believers of Christ, I have come to this point. Of our life as in, as in as in Christ, we are no more sinners. Sometimes I hear this in songs and uh, in certain lyrics of songs and uh, even certain declarations of certain well maybe professed Christian bodies, you know. But we are what we we are we are now being made to be the righteousness of God. Although we may sin, we are no more sinners. Hallelujah! Because of what the blood of Jesus. But the point we're looking at here is not as much as you can talk about from the very point of having to come into that. Uh, relationship with God the first day because that is what it, it, it is all about the blood of Jesus Christ was for our remission of sin but again when you are to live this life as a believer you know and then you are convicted and that's what the Holy Ghost does more the time because he doesn't want to live with sin <laughs> he doesn't want to live with that sin in this very temple of his he convicts us if you're a true believer of Christ you don't sin and just have it you know it's like uh, there's nothing has taken place I mean it, it, it can be some kind of indicator, I'm not sure, you know, because when you live as a true believer of Christ, always you're going to be convicted if you have done something that is not pleasing the sight of God. That is sinful. But it's expected of you go before God. This is where God put us. We are not in a new life. Now you can come before God, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this scripture tells us that we have been what? washed and clean. We have been, sorry, we have been washed clean. In the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's look at that same uh, uh, place of uh, uh, chapter. First John chapter 2 verse 29. 1 
1 John chapter 2, verse 29. This is the new life we are being offered as saved people. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. Hallelujah. And he reads here, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I mean, you could read it from verse 28 to maybe give you a better understanding of purity of life. He says, And now, little children, abide in me. Abide in me, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Now, this is referring to those that are saved, believers of Christ. You know, we should continue to live in God, to abide, to stay in, you know. And he said, when he appears, that we will have the confidence, you know, not to be ashamed before him. But it goes on to say, verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Well, that is what we are supposed to be doing in this new life. Every true believer of Christ, everyone that knows and believes that he has been saved in Christ, going through all that, you are to do, uh, you are to live a life of what? Obedience, in this case, a life of righteousness. A life of righteousness, not unrighteousness, but righteousness. So, that's, like I said, there are implications in this. You know, if you say you're a Christian, you don't just do things anyhow as you choose. No, you do things as your Lord is directing you, guiding you by the power of the Holy Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons or children of God. So you don't just live and say, I'm a Christian, and yet you are living daily, habitually in sin. Something is not right. There's a question mark to your salvation. And it's, the, it's necessary that you go to God and uh, let Him help you. You know, help, I mean, what it means? Go before God prayerfully and let Him, you know, lead you, you know, with the conviction that you need in order to, you know, come before Him the genuineness of your heart. So I encourage you, brother, sister, that this is some of the places that we've got to understand ourselves. The statue that we gained the new life. You know, I, I thought we were going to be looking into some other aspect of what we have entered into in terms of relationship with God when we say we are saved. It's something that is necessary we should all understand. But I think we will look at this next week as we can actually join up with the teaching on the church. As Let's see what happens when we come this week. But it's necessary that we remember those things. And again, we should also come to the point of understanding what we are set uh, us in this world. In the Bible tells us we are set apart, you know, we are set apart in this world. We are, I mean, Jesus said, you know, we, we may be in this world, but we are not supposed to be of the world. We are not to be controlled by the world. We have to know that when the word of God is used, the sanctification of our lives, it's a, the scripture, it's, a, it's a scripture that's used for our set apart for God. I encourage you. I mean, maybe you are sitting there and maybe asking yourself, what are these things? Hmm, I don't know how I can do it. This is not your own doing. This is not your own ability. It's the grace of God at work in your life. Hallelujah. You cannot do any of this by your own ability. It's the Holy Spirit that we just read. It's the Holy Spirit that would empower you, that would lead you. You know, so you don't struggle of anything of such. You only what depend on you. You surrender. You open up your heart. You commit yourself and let the Holy Ghost, you know, guide you as we read earlier on this very day. I trust that, you know, your relationship with God will be of clear evidence as such in the new life. God. You will be able to confidently say you are saved because you know what the Bible had to teach you in this respect. My dear brother, my dear sister, you got to be this man and woman that knows what that work of Christ has come to do in your life. That testimony that you bring across as being born again, that implication, that work of yours, that's of a proving, that's of a clear evidence that indeed you are. The Bible says we are not of the world. We should let our life so shine before men that they may see our good ways and give glory to our Father in heaven. So I pray that you, all of us, you know, I try that all of us will be able, you know, to know what it means to be a saved person and to walk accordingly, you know, in this very description as the Bible puts it. You know, be of this confidence. There are so many, we'll look at some of the scriptures today. So go back, look at it again, you know, and there are a lot you can even come across. As we get ourselves prepared for next week, you know, but you do some kind of work on it and understand when you say you are a saved person, what does that mean? Hallelujah. Because the church is concerned of people that are saved. And there's a kind of walk. There's a kind of lifestyle. We refer to it here. Kingdom life. It's a kingdom life. It's a life where the, the one that is in dominion of our life is him, King Jesus. Our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, let's be this kind of people of confidence and of hopefulness, you know, unto this our God in Jesus Christ. Because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you, no matter what we think we may be going through. God, richly bless you this very day.
Warwick is sent, sent, sent will strengthen you and make you be a man and woman who desire to know a lot more. Because you, do, you see, it's after the word of God that we are able to get to know this new life. So every time you read the Bible, ask yourself, is anything in the word of God that is telling me about this new life that I'm in Christ? You know, you may be reading something of totally contest, but you will see that there could be some principles that are embedded in that very contest, which tells you about who you are as a child of God, you who you are as a saved person, and so you'll be able to, to apply it to your life. Let's be this men and women. This is my prayer. I trust that everybody can understand this thing. This is what I'm working on. This is what I am trusting and believing God and reading the word of God for or concerning my life. This is what I want for every member of the body of Christ. So may you be this man, be this woman. Well, we are living it to this point, but I want to pray with you. Again, may not be you uh, a participant of this body of Christ, but it may be somebody who is, you know, maybe hearing us for the first time. I'm giving you the opportunity, the privilege that Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ wants you back to I mean, God loves you and has offered himself, his, his self, and he just cries to you. And I want you back to himself. Do you want to give your life to Jesus Christ? Do you want him to be your savior? Can he save you? Yes, I can come tell you he can save you. Not by you, any form of your ability. It's a work of grace. You, your faith just brings you to that place to say, that, Lord, I've heard these things today, but I want to receive you into my heart. Make me be of this new uh, person of life. Let me uh, let me have this new life, you know, for I'm opening my heart to you. If this is you, let's pray this prayer. Hallelujah. And you the believer that is here this already, again, I want to encourage you because you may have uh, come to the point of receiving this Christ. You know you are a child of God, but also I encourage you that you walk the ways of the Lord. Walk worthy of the Lord, the call of God upon your life. Don't let that kind of walk be tainted, be compromised. You know, however hard and difficult it may be to live the righteous life on this earth, you know, depend on the Holy Ghost and, you know, persist and pray, stay the word of God, trust Him. So let us pray and, uh, and, 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 and know that God is here to strengthen us, build us and equip us in this respect. Let's pray for the brother and sister who want to give their life to Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we want to thank you for this very day given to us once again. And we're looking into the subject of church and also salvation, which you've come to offer us in your son, Jesus. Today, Lord, we've opened our hearts. We've allowed ourselves to hear your voice so that your, your voice would impact our lives, especially at this point of giving our lives to you. This brother, this sister, as anybody is here this very day, want to give their life to Christ, I pray for them. That as they pray this prayer, Lord, it will be a sincere prayer of their heart. It will be a, an experience they've never had for a turning point of their life that they will know that indeed it is in Jesus Christ that they can be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for this work that you have already done. And you're even about to do in this brother and this sister. So, brother and sister, pray this prayer with us. I usually say a simple prayer, but it's much more than that. You know, Heavenly Father, I thank you for today, for hearing your word. I believe in your word that Jesus Christ is the one that has come to die for my sins. That can save me, make me a saved person. I open my heart to him. I open my heart to you, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and make me a new person. As I confess all my sins today, I surrender my life to you and I make a commitment to repent of my past lives. Today, make me a new person. Holy Spirit, help me to build, to be built up in Jesus Christ, to be this new person. I believe you alone Jesus Christ can be my Lord and my Savior. I receive into my heart in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we stand in agreement <coughs> with this brother and sister and obviously with you, you know, who is committing to this kind of life. He's coming back again to take us home. He's coming for the blameless. He's coming for he that is watchful, you know. So don't please take life for granted and live anyhow, even in the time that we're living in. Let's be watchful. And then walk in the way that is pleasing the sight of God. Walk as a safe person. Live as a safe person. Talk as a safe person. You know, whatever you do, let it all be to the glory of God. Yes, let us sing this song as we are about to live. And this song preparing you for the rest of the week. 10,000 reasons, you know, uh, of how you bless the Lord. 10,000 reasons. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. 
whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Hallelujah. You know, I hope as you sing this song, you're preparing yourself for the week that we are in. And let this song not just be the only time that you're going to be declaring before the Lord, you know, this kind of a, a description of himself and as a relationship that you have with him. Hallelujah. Well, God really bless you. We we'll look forward to see you once again next Sunday. We know you'll be here with us. God bless you and stay safe. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you.